in preparation for this session, we, we did a snapshot survey with Poverty Lines members. We had around 60 responses on, on general issues around accessing adult mental health services. One of the one of the things that that struck us from uh, from the responses that we had was the increase in um, more focused approaches from community based third sector organisations. So we asked um, what the change in the the um, representation of mental health issues for those organisations had been since before the pandemic to now, and um, around about 15% um, were always dealing with mental health issues. So, so when individuals using their services presented, there was always a component of mental health um, in the, the reason for the presentation. Now seeing that 40% of those organizations see um, people presenting with, ment with mental health issues um, every time. So, so so the organisations we're working with have seen a significant increase um, in the in the representation of mental health issues. And these are these are some of them are specialist organisations working on mental health specifically. Many of them are not. Many of them are um, you know food banks, uh, advice organisations, and they're having to um, scale up if you like in 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 order to deal with um, the change in uh, nature of the 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 issues that people present with. But in terms of the challenges that the, uh, the people face in accessing services, they are similar to what um, Joe has just has mentioned. So the importance of GPs, I think um, almost all of the respondents talked about the importance of GPs being the, the initial um, uh, gateway into receiving help. And I think there are very well-known problems with, um, with accessing GP services and and then the, the issue of what happens to the onward referral and um, to specialist services um, where those are made and um, not always receiving a service once a referral is made um, was one of the issues that was was mentioned. Um, and I think the, the additional question is some of the practical dimensions of access and services. So we had a number of organisations based in rural parts of Scotland where um, the very real um, problems of accessible transport to allow people to actually engage services was a very real one. And, and that was something that, that actually acted as a barrier to people um, receiving the help that they need. Thank you. Yeah, I think it's, it's well understood that poverty is both a, a cause of mental health problems and a, and a consequence. So I think at a time of acute financial crisis really that we've been through since the, the start of the pandemic where we know that uh, people who are already on low incomes um, uh, 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 suffered most during the pandemic and then moving into the period of the cost of living crisis which we're still very much in we shouldn't be surprised that that translates into increased demand across a whole range of services related to, to mental health um, I suppose a, a couple of areas or a couple of points just to make in, in that context. We did some research with the, um, and the Scottish Women's Budget Group into women's experience of the cost of living crisis. And one of the very clear um, messages coming out of that was the, the mental health impacts of, of for women in particular, having to, to manage poverty, as, as that report said, uh, of being very much responsible um, for for often being responsible for care within a family and and trying to juggle that at a time of uh, acute financial crisis. Um, the the other related issue I think is debt. Um, so we have seen increasing levels of debt. One of uh, the Poverty Alliance members who responded to our, our survey noted that from the period between 2018 to now. Um, a third of their clients, debt advice agency, a, a third of their clients were reporting su suicidal ideation when they presented. Now, half of their clients are reporting suicidal idea ideation. I think that that one uh, statistic from that one organisation is really quite compelling about the impact that um, our current context is having on, on individuals' mental health. 
the other part of your question was around what happens to that demand. And I think as as Simon and, and Chari and others have said, the importance of of um voluntary sector community organizations in providing alternatives to um to primary care to address um mental health issues early is is really important and i know we will talk about funding those those services are very much under under stress but what what our members told us their response to this current context has been um they've, they've done various things so around about uh, almost 70 percent had increased um training to staff and volunteers around mental health and um, very often that was around um mental health first aid um but looking to as i said earlier to skill up their their staff and their volunteers to be better able to um, to support the people that they're working with. Around about a fifth had recruited specialist staff who were providing specialist services to enable them to better able respond to these these areas. But I, th I think this is this is the tip of the iceberg and really organizations are, are undoubtedly struggling to uh, to respond to the demand that's there. The, the answers to how we reduce mental health inequalities lie outside, largely lie outside of the, the mental health system. So um, I think one thing that we do need to do in terms of um, policy within Scottish Government and um, other parts of the, the policy making framework in Scotland is make sure that there's alignment. So is there alignment between our efforts to reduce child poverty? We have a very well developed uh, child poverty strategy with regular delivery plans, but are they really as closely aligned to um, issues around mental health and reducing mental health inequalities? Do they pay good good enough, uh, do they take good enough cognizance of, of mental health issues? I think there's some way to go there yet. Again, we have priorities around developing a, a well-being economy. Now, that absolutely has to um, be fundamental to addressing mental health inequalities. So when we look at the way that our labour market operates, um, issues around uh, security of, of contract, around uh, stability of, of work, around uh, the hours that people have, these all contribute to whether we're effective in reducing mental health inequalities. So I think taking that into account when we're developing our approaches in these areas will, will help reduce those inequalities. And, and one further area that I think is, is really important is around housing. And we know that the Edinburgh has, has just declared a housing emergency. We know the, the stress, the, the um, impact that insecure accommodation has on people. If we're to address mental health inequalities, if we're to address um, the, the stress that comes through homelessness, then, then that's one area that we need to prioritise, I think.